And the webinar, the webinar that we're bringing to you today is called Pets and Pollinators, Using Business as a Force for Good. And it's a, a unique partnership that we are gonna highlight today um, for you. And it's a, a little different than what we normally do with uh, more specific information on how to develop a partnership and how we work with our partners. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about sustainability and there's gonna be a couple topics on here that will be, I think, of real interest to you today. And I wanna start out by, by um, saying that we're gonna, have a system here where there's a chat function on the bottom of your screen and you'll use that chat function to tell us who you are and where you're from. You'll see examples of that on the site already. And then there's a Q&A function as well. Um, and that's where you're going to ask any questions that you have throughout the webinar. And at the end, I'm going to compile those questions and get those responses for you. And there's a picture of myself and our uh, project coordinator, Pete uh, Berthelsen, our partnership coordinator. So the Q&A function's at the bottom of your screen. Put your name and location with your question when you do ask a question. And so oh, we've got an example of a question here for you that you can take a look at. When you go to the Q&A part, hey, I'm Bob from Columbus. I own a small business. I'm interested in installing a solar energy system. How can that effort benefit pollinator habitat? And then we'll answer those questions for you at the end of the program. This program will be recorded and we will send you the recording at the end of the program. And that kind of uh, fills in all the important stuff for how you're gonna react with us. Um, we, we do have your microphone muted. So the Q&A function um, is what you're gonna use to ask your questions. So with that, I would like to introduce Melissa or Lissy Rappaport Schiffman. Uh, Lissy and Jim are the founders of Project Hive Pet Company. They live in Minnesota. They have two daughters and two cats. And they're going to talk a little bit about this partnership for you and, and kind of give you some ideas on how you might be able to develop something like this in your workspace. I'm going to turn it over to Lissy now to go ahead and get us started. Great. Thank you, Elsa. Thanks for everybody. Uh, for being here. Um, yeah, I'm Melissa rappaport Shiftman or Lissy. I'm coming to you from Minneapolis, and we're really excited to tell you about our partnership with the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. Uh, but first, a little bit about Project Hive Pet Company. We founded it to make great pet products, but we also founded a company because we have a fundamental belief that businesses can and should be a major player in making the world a better place. And we're seeing that this happen um, in the marketplace. It's sort of a transformation that's happening. And it started really a long time ago with businesses like Interface Flooring, uh, who is not only trying to be not harmful to our environment, but to actually be restorative. Patagonia, another example, the apparel company, has gone as far as saying their mission is, we're in business to save our home planet. So that is pretty inspiring. And we're not alone. Uh, there's a growing movement of certified B Corp companies that are literally changing our world. These are companies that consider not only the interest of shareholders, but all stakeholders. So our employees, workers, the community, and the environment. Um, Project Hive is, is working towards this important certification right now. And we think our, our planet needs saving as well. So we founded. Project Hive Pet Company with a mission to save the bees. There's our little slide. Before the dog toys and treats that help save the bees. Why did we do that? Um, bees have frequently been voted the most important species on the planet. They're responsible for pollinating at least a third of our food, for making honey, and a big part of our entire agricultural system. But unfortunately, our land isn't doing a great job of nourishing and sustaining the bees. So they need our help. And there are three ways that Project Hive is helping. First, through our product. So our toys and our treats and our packaging, which are all made in the US, uh, they have a honeybee inspired design. So you can see how our toys have the yellow bee color and the iconic honeybee hive shape. Our packaging 
is a hexagonal honeycomb in shape and in colors that are inspired by nature and wildflowers. And we have a line of treats that are all non-GMO project verified, which was really important to our brand and our mission. They contain organic honey um, and they also have the hive design. So these products gently remind people about bees and nature. And it also helps that when people play with their dogs, they're often playing outside. Second, we advocate for homeowners to transform their lawns into wildflower habitat. And we do this through our blog posts and uh, through social media posts. And we go into some depth here because there are so many benefits to replacing lawns with wildflowers. Um, you don't have to mow it, so you reduce harmful emissions. Um, you typically don't have to irrigate, so you reduce water stresses, which is becoming more and more important with our more frequent droughts. And then third, we're reducing chemicals from not having to fertilize those lawns and keep them the bright green. Um, lawns uh, comprise about 50 million acres in the U.S. And while, while they're um, pretty and nice and they, they do some, serve some purpose, I'm not saying eliminate all of them, that they don't really provide much benefit to our ecosystem. Um, so this movement of trying to transform lawns into wildflowers, um, if, you're, if you're doing this or have already done it, please let us know, send us pictures, tell us your challenges, your story, um, and how it's going, because we're really trying to create a movement here. So just imagine if 50% of all lawns were converted into pollinator-friendly habitat, that would be 25 million acres. Um, we're also, we've got little seed envelopes um, with Save the Bees, and we have harvested all of our echinacea uh, plants ourselves, and we're going to be putting this on our website sometime in the next few months um, for free to just have people, you know, you can plant echinacea seeds, which are great, um, great flowers for bees. They just love them. But beyond advocacy of our products, um, and pretty much why we're here today, is that we want to make more of an impact and really be able to scale our impact we're, we're a business and we have dollars coming in with every sale. So the third component is through donating our dollars. We scoured the landscape for organizations that are really making a difference in this space. And there are so many wonderful nonprofits advocating for bees and for pollinators. It was hard to choose. It was sort of overwhelming at first, but we, one of the pieces that um, is important to us in understanding our impact is being able to measure and track against a goal. Um, and it's it's hard to count bees. It's really hard to say, are, are we doing a good job saving the bees? So we were lucky enough to find uh, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund through a mutual acquaintance, um, Rob Davis from Fresh Energy, which is a, a renewable energy um, advocacy organization here in Minnesota. Um, and we've been talking to them for several years since we first had this idea. Um, and I'll let Pete tell you more about the great work they're doing, but before I turn it over, um, I wanna tell you what this partnership is. So we have an agreement with 1% for the planet, that's the little blue logo at the top of the slide. And this is an organization that was founded by one of my heroes, Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia, the apparel company. And this organization was founded in 2002. Um, What's surprising, I don't know if people know this, but only 3% of philanthropic giving goes to environmental causes. So 1% for the planet is on a mission to change that. They've got a network of over 4,000 environmental organizations to choose from, and 1% for the planet basically prevents greenwashing, prevents people from just saying, oh yeah, we donate. They certify that organizations actually give at least 1% of their gross sales to one of their organizations. So our partnership, our agreement with 1% for the planet means we commit to donating at least 1% of our gross sales to a nonprofit. And for us and for our mission to save the bees, um, that's the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund who is now listed as another organization in their network. So we just launched our products in February. Um, so we started getting dollars in. And so we just recently made our first donation. And we are really proud that our contribution is going to support five projects in four different states, totaling over 15 acres of healthy habitat to be planted this fall. And, and that's just the beginning. So as we grow, as we sell more of our products, 
more and more acres will be planted. And so that's a measurable, trackable goal and it's healthy habitat that Pete's gonna tell you more about. So as we like to say, um, uh, let's make our planet thrive, one happy dog and countless bees at a time. And really one of the goals of what we wanna communicate here is to support having more innovative and collaborative relationships like this. So I'm gonna turn it over to Pete Berthelsen to give you more interesting facts about this wonderful nonprofit and how they are working to help save the bees and really our, our home planet. All right, thank you, Melissa. <clears throat> and I know we've had a couple of people that have kind of hopped on after we've started. So I just wanna do a little administrative work and say, please go into the chat function and give us, let everybody see your name and where you're from and then ask your questions in the Q&A function. And Elsa will be moderating those and bring those questions back to Lissy and I at the end of this presentation. So thanks everybody for being here today. I wanna uh, go into a little bit more detail about who the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is because many of you that are on here have probably never heard of the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund before. And then just talk about this unique relationship that is just starting with an entity like private, like Project Hive Pet Company. And just a, as way of a real brief introduction, I'm coming to you today from central Nebraska, a region of the state called the Luss Hills that is kind of evenly divided between uh, crop production and rangeland. I'm a uh, farmer rancher. I am a amateur beekeeper many things, wear many hats, but at its core, I'm a biologist that has spent my career working on trying to figure out how to get habitat, highly diverse, productive habitat onto the landscape um, like we see in this photo right here. So before we kind of start into the meat of this discussion, I wanna give you four thoughts that kind of are the foundation of how the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund approaches things. And the first is that I think that right now we're in a really unique moment in time. A unique moment in time where the general public and corporations like Project Hive Pet Company understand that there are significant concerns and problems going on with uh, pollinator health whether it's honeybees or monarch butterflies or rusty patch bumblebees. And all you have to do is look at the national media. And when there are articles in the New York Times about monarch butterflies and that sort of thing, it really shows this elevated understanding that the, and concern that the public has. And that means that it's also a unique opportunity at this moment in time to really kind of do something to make a difference. And that's, what, that's where Project Hive Pet Company has stepped forward and raised their hand and said, we wanna make a difference. The second foundational thought that we have is that not all pollinator habitat is created equal. Just because a plant has a flower on it doesn't mean that it provides great pollinator value. So at the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, we work very, very specifically and in a detailed fashion to design our pollinator seed mixtures that you'll see a little bit later in a very specific and innovative manner to make sure that we're maximizing the pollinator health and habitat benefits of it. The third thought that we have at the start of this is that if we try to solve pollinator health and habitat issues using the same tools that we've been using for the last decade or two, we absolutely will fail. We have to be coming at this approach with new and innovative ways of getting things done. And to kind of underscore that, I'll just show you this graph <clears throat> that is the estimate of the Eastern monarch butterfly population each winter as it travels to the mountaintop in central Mexico and they estimate uh, the, uh, the population. Well, if you look at this population estimate for the last 20 or 30 years, in this red line is where the population needs to be minimum to be sustain, uh, sustainable 
it's been a good 20 years before we've really been there. And one of the very early predictions that I hope does not come true is that this year's population estimate will be about half of last year's. And if you look at the uh, last two bars on here, last year was less than half of the year before that. So if that prediction comes true, we're, at, we're in a significantly severe downward trend. This is where the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund has stepped forward wanting to provide key innovative, productive pollinator habitat projects. And we do this through our efforts that we call next gen habitat projects. And the last, the fourth uh, foundational thought that I'll give you at the start of this is that when we have an acre of habitat, we need to make it the best it can be. We simply do not have enough acres on the landscape. So when we get one, whether it's a monarch butterfly garden in the backyard or a larger project or on a corporate campus, we need to make that planting the best that it can be. So the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund works on a number of projects in a number of ways in which we provide free pollinator seed mixtures on projects that are two acres or larger. It's open to private land, public land, or corporate land, which you should interpret as any land. We have a very simple application project process, and then you receive one-on-one -on -one technical guidance to make sure that your project is a huge success. Our flagship program, not the only thing we do, but our flagship program that we'll be working with Project Hive Pet Company on is called Seed a Legacy. And the Seed a Legacy program currently operates in a 12 state region. And for everybody that's on the webinar today, that's like, well, that's not in our state. Let me tell you that first that we started with two states, then we went to six states, then we went to 10, and now we're at 12. We're very strategically and methodically growing and expanding, and we're coming to your area. If you reside in a state that is not yellow, and you're interested in learning how we could bring the Seed a Legacy program to your state even sooner, drop that information into the Q&A section, and uh, Elsa and Mary will be following up with all of those questions. And we will, uh, we will be happy to chat with you about that. But just know we're coming. Uh, this 12 state region was selected based on a number of factors, two of which are one, it's a critically important region to commercial beekeeping and uh, honeybee hive health. And it's also one of the most important regions of the country for the Eastern monarch butterfly population recovery. If you're looking at this map and you reside in an area of the country that is red, orange, or yellow, you reside in an area that is critically important to monarch butterfly population recovery. So that's why we're working in that area and have identified that right now. The Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund takes a really unique and innovative approach to how we do habitat. Been working on conservation programs for over 30 years and I know of no other program that takes this approach. And that is that when we establish habitat, we provide two different seed mixtures for every project. One we refer to as a honeybee mix and one we call a monarch butterfly mix. The honeybee mix is comprised of Clover species, uh, it has that in there with the wildflowers and the grasses. And the monarch butterfly mix is a minimum of 40 native wildflower species, probably more likely 50, 60, or 70 wildflower species, very diverse, and it just establishes differently. Here's what I mean. Our honeybee mix literally looks like this after two months very, very fast establishing, provides pollinator forage and value just immediately. Our monarch butterfly mix establishes more slowly. 
We sometimes like to say that in year one, it sleeps. In year two, it creeps. And in year three, it leaps. So pollinators use and benefit from both seed mixtures equally, love them, but because they establish so very differently, we plant them into two separate plantings. That's a very unique and innovative approach uh, that we take. So at this moment in time, some of you are probably thinking like, well, I wonder how they're able to do all of this stuff. How, how are they able to afford it? Well, I wanna take this moment to tell you what we are and what the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is, is a big tent. And by that, I mean that there is an opportunity for all kinds of support and involvement. And I wanna take just a moment to kind of show you the width and the breadth of who it is that is financially supporting the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And this little exercise is not representative of everybody that is supporting us, but it kind of shows um, some of the commonalities. And the first would be from the food industry, uh, Whole Foods, Costco, uh, different things like that. And the next kind of example would be uh, the retail industry. Things like uh, Target, Pura Vida Bracelets, Project Hive Pet Company, and entities like that. The next kind of group would be the beekeeping industry, individual commercial beekeepers, honey packers, uh, national beekeeping organizations, beekeeping supply companies, things like that. The next one would be foundations and nonprofits that have been very, very generous uh, with their support for what we're doing. And then we slide to crop commodity groups, the corn growers, the potato council, things like that. And then the last one would be what I would refer to as egg industry, groups like Syngenta and Bayer and BASF. And I think that in this world today, there probably are not lots of examples of where an entity like a Whole Foods or a Costco is working directly with a group like a Syngenta or a Bear. But under this big tent called the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, there's an opportunity for everybody that cares about pollinator health and habitat to come together to be supportive of that. Because when you have a big, hairy, audacious problem like pollinator health that is complicated and hard to fix, it takes all hands on deck to be able to come up with those solutions. So one of the things that I want you to leave with today is that as an entity, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund works really, really hard to find a reason to say yes to projects when they come to us. And we get all kinds of things coming to us looking for support that we never thought of before, never considered it. And we, we work really hard to find a reason to say yes when we can be assured of a great pollinator outcome. If we can check that box, the site prep is in place. We know it's going to be planted and managed and treated right. We work very hard to find a reason to say yes and don't say no due to a programmatic reason like uh, you don't have a cropping history or something like that. And the other thing is, is that we work really, really hard to produce multiple benefits. Yes, the name of the organization is uh, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, but it's about way, way more than bees and butterflies. It's about soil health, water quality, precision agriculture, food sustainability, grassland songbirds, honeybees, native bees, monarch butterflies, all kinds of things that can benefit from the sort of work and habitat projects that we're putting onto the landscape. I think just as importantly as when we explain to you who we are, I think it's just as important to tell you who we're not. And we are not an organization that tends to draw a line in the sand and say, you're bad, you have to stay on that side of the line. Um, 
it seemed my pers my personal perspective is is in this thing called the pollinator world, there are lumpers and splitters. There are entities that like to identify companies or groups that they think have had a negative impact on pollinator health and habitat and say, you can't be part of what we're doing. That's not the approach that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund takes. Um, we really absolutely try to take the approach of there is room for everybody at the table. And if we're going to need to have all hands on deck to uh, come up with the solution and the answers, then let's really have all hands on deck. Because the real answer is we need to get as much high quality, highly diverse, great habitat on the landscape as we can. And a picture like this will benefit soil health, water quality, grassland songbirds, uh, food sustainability, renewable energy projects, honeybees, native bees, butterflies, the whole deal. And that's the approach that we take. So I think I kind of want to wrap up my portion of this by letting you know that there's lots of opportunities in which we can work. And if you're on today's webinar and you're kind of representing a company or a corporation or a group that is kind of thinking, well, I wonder how we could do something. Let us show you a couple examples that might stimulate uh, some of your thinking. The first that I'm gonna talk about is renewable energy. And I know that we have some friends from the solar energy industry that are on today's call. And so I'm gonna spend a little bit more time talking about renewable energy. Um, there is a phenomenal opportunity to include pollinator benefits with new solar energy projects that are going in. And currently the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is working on projects in 17 states. We provide technical guidance and access to seed. And we're working on small private solar projects all the way to large utility scale projects that are going in. And every solar energy project that goes in has one huge consideration for what's planted with the solar energy project. And that is the height that the lower panel is off the ground. Whether it's 36 inches off the ground or 30 or 24 inches, that height determines and influence is what we can plant underneath it. Because if the lower panel height is 24 inches, we don't want to design a vegetative cover mix that would grow taller than 18, 20, 22 inches. Because if we do, then it's going to have to be mowed. So one of the things that we can do is the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund and our strategy of using two different seed mixtures works perfect with solar energy where we can design and use our honeybee mix on a solar energy project under the panels and design a seed mixture that does not grow too tall. And then outside the panel area where we don't have a vegetative height restriction, we can use that monarch butterfly mix and put both seed mixtures into that project and get phenomenal pollinator health and habitat benefits associated with every solar energy project going in. Corporate campuses are another option where we're doing work. Here's an example of a new project going in on a corporate campus in Des Moines. This happens to be with Wright Service Corporation. And they're actually putting this in as part of their sustainability plan. We're currently in phase two. Have a great sign up here explaining to everybody what's happening. The company has put walking trails already established in and the employees of the corporation are gonna go out and plant some of the pollinator habitat and really kind of own what this project looks like and how it functions. Great example of what we're doing out there. School lands are another example. With this high school, uh, they started out putting solar panels on the roof of their buildings. Not a lot of opportunity for pollinator habitat there, 
But when they expanded that effort to include panels that were on the ground, uh, on the land associated with the school, we're now going in and we are establishing pollinator habitat associated with that portion of their renewable energy. Private landowners are always going to be the bread and butter of where we're uh, working on projects. This happens to be a photo of some landowners project from Minnesota. And this photo was taken 14 months after it was planted. And what a great example of what pollinator habitat can look like when it follows all of the necessary steps to prepare the site and then to plant it correctly. And that is the one-on-one -on -one technical guidance that we provide for each and every project that we work with. Wastewater treatment plants. It, to some degree, it surprises me how many of these projects are coming to us uh, every year where a municipality contacts us and says, you know, we have a wastewater treatment plant that is surrounded by all kinds of grass that we have to mow every seven to 10 days. We're interested in converting that to pollinator habitat so we can number one, reduce our maintenance, our time and our equipment that goes into mowing that. And number two, we can be doing things sustainably for our community. What a great example of a, of a project there. Here's a unique project from Michigan that uh, you probably never would have considered before. And in this regional airport, the airport actually owns a bunch of ground around where the runways are. And that ground is currently being leased for agricultural use. So that's fine. But next to the regional airport is a river that actually has a resident Canada goose problem on it. And when the Canada geese fly off the river every day and go over and feed in the waste grain from the agricultural fields, every now and then they wander onto the airport runway. And that's not a good thing. So we've developed a strategy of where we're actually establishing pollinator habitat in a design that acts a little bit as a barrier between the runway and the airport proper and keeping the geese and other birds off of the runway. Pretty innovative manner of getting great, great habitat on the landscape. State and federal publicly owned lands, we're uh, working with those, whether it's a wildlife management area or a national refuge uh, and establishing pollinator habitat. Utility right-of-ways are another area where we're really starting to do a bunch of work. This is an electrical utility line right here. But if you think about all the utility right-of-ways in the country, here, here's kind of some rough numbers. There's about 9 million acres of power line right-of-ways in the country, 12 million acres of pipelines like this one, and 17 million acres of roadside right-of-ways. Uh, some quick math tells me I think that adds up to about 38 million acres of right-of-way opportunity to do work in the country to establish and maintain pollinator habitat. If we had just a fraction of that, that could have a huge impact. Zoos are another area where we're working on establishing habitat that is a great educational opportunity for the public to come and see what it looks like and what the benefits are. In the state of Iowa, we've actually even established pollinator habitat on the land associated with a prison. Hard to believe, but we'll do it there too. City parks and hike and bike trails are another example of where clear public benefits, educational benefits, pollinator habitat benefits, and we're just working on all kinds of projects like that. Hopefully that provided you with a view and kind of stimulated you to think about some opportunities that you might have to bring a diverse set of interests together. I think that pollinators and their habitat needs are a unique glue that can connect all those things we've mentioned. Water quality, soil health, honeybees, uh, the food we eat, 
uh, food sustainability issues, monarch butterflies, grassland songbirds, and on and on and on. And the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund stands ready uh, to work with you on those issues. So can there be a more diverse joining of interests than a pet product company and a nonprofit looking to put pollinator habitat on the ground? That's a great example. We're excited about the leadership that Project Hive Pet Company is bringing to bear on this and the significant impact that they're gonna have in the immediate future starting this fall. So as you're listening to this, I'm just gonna wrap it up and say that hopefully you're kind of thinking about, well, you know, what, what could we do here? Well, I wanna leave you with a couple suggestions. The first is, if you know of a corporate or a company sustainability program that would like to support pollinator health and habitat, let us know. We would love to have that conversation and be a part of it. But there's even more that individuals on this call can do. The first thing is most people have never heard of the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. Help us uh, promote the opportunity for projects to a wider audience. If you are an entity, uh, another nonprofit, a group, a corporation, a company that wants to talk about how we can work on pollinator health and habitat, let's co-host another webinar just like we did today uh, with Project Hive Pet Company. And let's promote that to an even wider audience that's out there. If you have a vehicle by which you could get C to Legacy program flyers out to your customers, a larger audience, you have a meeting coming up, city officials, something like that, drop us a message in the Q&A function. We will send you flyers uh, for that purpose. And the last thing is follow both Project Hive Pet Company and the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund on social media. We're on all the stuff, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of those sorts of things and like and give us a follow. So with that, I'm gonna just thank you for your time today. And we're gonna turn it over to Elsa here for her to uh, read us some of the different questions and things that have come on. We really appreciate your time. This is such a unique moment in time we have a unique opportunity to make a significant difference. Every, there's room for everybody at the table. Everybody can be involved in this. And uh, just the opportunity that entities like Project Hive Pet Company have shown, I uh, describe them as the pointy end of the spear. They're taking a leadership role. They're raising their hand. They're stepping forward and they're saying, we want to do something to make a difference. And the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund stands ready to be one of your partners if that's one of your goals as well. So with that, I appreciate the time and I'm gonna turn it back over to Elsa. Thanks, Pete. I sure appreciate it. So there's several questions, but I wanna kind of give you and, and Lissy a flavor for the folks that are on today. Um, we're from one side of the coast to the other. We've got Rhode Island in the house, um, Iowa, Ohio, North Carolina, California. We have folks from all over on this call. Um, some of our cooperators from Ohio and South Dakota are on as well. Some of our Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund participants. Uh, Burton Porter just received his seed and he got it in the ground already. So we're excited and Joe is, um, Joseph from Ohio is on. I know he's done a planting and, and maybe even a second uh, supplemental planting as well. So <clears throat> we've got folks from National Park Service on today. We're doing projects with them. Uh, Syngenta, um, some of our energy uh, partners are on as well. National Honey Board is in, in the house here as well today. Nice. So we've got quite a few folks. Um, Project um, Hive from Canada is on. So we've got uh, quite a few uh, folks from all over the board. Uh, but I do want to start nice. with some questions. And Pete, I'll, I'm going to start with a few questions for Lissy. We've got a couple. One that was uh, one we had yesterday that that, uh, that fella has also jumped back on again today. And he was asking, 
how do we how do we recommend that he gets his business? He's on the leadership team in the business, but he's not the owner. How does he get his business to think about donating or partnering with a group like the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund? So, Lissy, I'm going to start with that question for you, and then we've got several more here in the queue um, for both of you. Actually, uh, quite a few questions already started. So, Lissy, if you would handle that one, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I'd love to have a, a dialogue about that because it sort of depends on is the company already, um, you know, donating to something, and it's just a matter of talking about doing, you know, something that's more environmental, you know, are they already giving or are they not giving? Um, you know, if, if they're, the the idea of, of business and, and philanthropy is, it's pretty well studied and it can really help uh, businesses uh, brand and reputation and their community image. Um, and it can also boost employee morale so there's a great um, Inc. magazine uh, that talks about corporate giving is good for your soul and also the bottom line, because employees are happier that you might have better retention, less turnover. And um, there have been a lot of studies that support that uh, millennials in particular, uh, only like 70% of them will actively support brands and companies that have a cause that they believe in. And many of them will only work for companies like that. So there are a lot of great arguments for that. Um, you know, if it's to get them to sort of change the um, parameters around what corporate philanthropy looks like. I mean, I think it's just a conversation and maybe sharing one of Pete's uh, webinars. Um, I just think it's such a great story to talk about um, what an impact you know, this can make across so many different issues. It's not just like an environmental issue. This is this is a, a health issue, a health of all of our species that live on this planet. Elsa, I, oh, Elsa ahead, I, I'd like to add to that um, with a little bit of a story that it, when I heard it, I, I it just made me step back and kind of say, wow. And I was giving a presentation to the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, okay? And one of the large electronic, a national electronics company was talking with me afterwards and, and informed me that their sustainability platform, their goal as an organization was by 2030, they wanted to be net carbon zero. You know, and I nodded my head. Yep, that's very, very nice. And then they went on to explain to me that that's just not, it's not that simple. That also, that goal also includes every product we sell. Okay. So that is uh, if uh, you buy a washing machine or a refrigerator or a stereo from this com company, when the end user plugs it into their wall, they're covering that energy as well. So that was kind of like, that, that's impressive. And then he blew me away when he, so obviously solar energy is going to be a big part of how they get there, renewable energy. And then he expressed to me, we're very interested in having pollinator value be part of our solar energy efforts because that will be a key component to our employee retention plan. And that blew me away to hear that story. And I think I, I raised my hand and wanted to tell that story because I think it really solidifies uh, what Lissy just talked about. That's a good one, Pete. <clears throat> I, yeah, I wanted I think to, oh, yeah. Sorry, just that more, more and more businesses are starting to have sustainability goals and make them more public and transparent. And so it's, it's a great way to talk about how you're meeting those goals. Yeah. And if, well, I guess just to, just to finish that up, Elsa, if somebody, you know, thinks that in any way a conversation with the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund could be helpful in nudging that and answering some questions, we would be happy to be part of that. And I think that I'll speak for Lissy and say that Project Hive Pet Company would also raise their hand and be happy to be part of that because they are the pointy end of the spear. <laughs> And so we have a question from Tim Bartouche that was posted here. Uh, Melissa, it's kind of a follow-up to the same concept here. How do you plan to market the fact that you're giving to the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund? Do you think it will help your sales? 
So that great question. Yeah, that is a great question. So for marketing, um, all of our packaging has on the front, I don't know if you can see this. Um, it has woof worthy dog toys and treats that help save the bees. And then on the back, it goes into a little bit more detail about, um, I'll just read it. I don't know. It says 1% of your purchase helps save the bees by planting wildflowers. And then there's a little bit more educate. A part of it is just an education. You know, one in three mouthfuls of food exist because of bee pollination. Um, yeah, that's our, Elsa's holding up an, an insert that we put in there talking about purchase with a purpose. So yep. we have and it I on our- I received that with my dog package that I got, got yeah. from my puppies. So we have it on our packaging. We have an insert in our um, boxes that we send. And then, you know, on, on our website, we go into detail. Our packaging doesn't specifically mention that we give to the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. We did talk about that, but there's only so much you can put on, on your packaging. But our website does talk about that it's the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And, and we were, are going to do more, more blog posts on that as well. And yes, um, you know, we do think it it will help in sales. I mean, it's actually kind of what differentiates us as a brand. We're one of the few authentic mission-driven pet companies out there. I mean, that was part of our, our, um, our thought process in, in starting a pet company. And we know that millennials and millennial-minded people want to support businesses that are, are doing good things. So we do, we do think it helps us differentiate ourselves. Great. There are a lot of dog toys and treat companies out there. <laughs> sure. Sure, but if you're going to give to conservation and you care about that aspect of it, you know, why wouldn't we, I mean, I, I, have, I have eight dogs, I'll admit it, you know, they like toys, I'm, I'm nowhere I'm buying from now, so <laughs> a lot of people care, so, all right, well, let me get on to these other questions, uh, let's see, there's, this might be more focused for Pete, um, let me see, uh, what does long-term maintenance look like for the projects, Pete, that's a, that's a good one. Yeah. So, okay. Nice question. So the first thing that I'll say is that there's nothing that you can do where pollinator habitat is concerned, where you plant it, walk away from it and always have great habitat. It doesn't work that way. Natural succession will come into play and our projects with management do not need to be replanted. And I guess I'll just wrap it up by saying that one of the products that we have produced is called a Pollinator Habitat Establishment and Management Guide. And if you go to our website, beingbutterflyhabitatfund.org, that is available free to anybody that wants it. Um, you can uh, find a link to it on our Facebook page. You can go to our website. Um, if you say you want to take the easy route and you want to just say, send me a link, put that in the Q&A and we will send it, we will send you the link afterwards uh, to your email address where you can just click on it and have it. Great. Okay, so um, following up, we got a solar related question, Pete, it, and it's a two part question. You know, I'm good at those. I won't give them to Lissy yet because, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to confuse her, but I like confusing you, Pete. So <laughs> do you, uh, there's two, so it's a two part question from Chris. Do you sell a seed mix to replace grass and sow under solar panels that's suitable in Southern California? That's that's mm -hmm. the first part of the question. Okay. Seed mix in solar California for solars. And if you know of solar projects being planted or currently built, what is the best way to approach them? Uh, well, um... Elsa definitely asked really about four or five questions there, really. She posed it as two, but um, so, the, so the answer to the first question is, yes, we do that sort of thing all the time. And a, a, a seed mixture for solar can be designed that the cost component to it is essentially the same as if you were gonna just plant it to turf type grass, which the solar industry probably has a lot more experience with and about the future O&M and what it costs and all of that kind of stuff. We can design a solar energy final vegetative seed cover that establishes quickly uh, with, with stands mowing, will be there for 20 to 30 years, has the right height, the right pollinator value, 
all for essentially the same cost. So that can be done. Here's the but. The but is this came from Southern California. Yes. California is, you know, if you think about it, you literally range from a desert to a tropical rainforest in one state. It's a very challenging uh, environment and every single project, whether we're talking about solar or a corporate campus or a private landowner, every single project that we work on needs to be approached individually where we talk about and learn about the goals and objectives of that project, the soil type, the site prep, how's it gonna be planted, how can it be managed? And we come up with and design a, a seed mixture that fits that individual project objectives. And that's a really key component. I, most people probably just think about, oh, we can get seed from the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. The technical guidance that is provided is the real magic sauce of the project. And most projects that come to us undergo one full year of preparation to be able to be planted and to be successful. If you think about that landowner image that we showed where I said that was 14 months after planting, that doesn't just happen. That happens following a strategic plan. And that's the magic sauce that Elsa brings to each and every project as the project habitat coordinator and providing that one-on-one -on -one technical guidance and bringing decades worth of experience into how to do that. Well, thank you, Pete. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions for the panelists. So- I'll, uh, Then I, I will just conclude with a couple of thoughts. Can I just kind of free associate Elsa? Yes. The first thing that I want to do is I want to give a major league shout out to beekeepers and the beekeeping industry because the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund at its foundation was formed by commercial beekeepers. And the reason that I want to give that shout out is it would have been really easy for uh, beekeepers and the honey packing industry and all of that kind of stuff, those groups that came together to say that we needed an entity like the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund to just focus solely and look solely at uh, beekeeping and honeybee, what, what do honeybees need? And it's really simple. But very quickly, they understood and accepted that if we take the approach that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund has, we can benefit honeybees, native bees, butterflies, soil health, water quality, grassland songbirds, food sustainability, renewable energy, corporate sustainability programs, just on and on and on and on and on. And again, if you wanna solve a big, hairy, audacious problem, you have to have all hands on deck. And that was what they adopted and pulled into this strategy right out of the chute. And that is why we have relationships like we're talking about today with an entity like Project Hive Pet Company. Yes, sir, that's exactly, exactly what we would like to see more of. We get more of what we recognize. And I think uh, Lizzie and Jim are doing a great job with their program and, and we, sure, oh. we sure appreciate uh, the uh, webinar and, and folks being on here. Uh, okay, it, so I'm gonna just I'm gonna just uh, close with uh, Charlotte asked a question about how we can re-watch the webinar. So it will be recorded, and we will send out the recording to all of the participants who registered for the webinar. So we had uh, over 120 uh, register for the webinar. So we will be sending out this link that will allow you to watch that webinar. And you can reach out to us uh, via email or, you know, through any network that you have, Facebook as well. So we thank you for being here, especially on Veterans Day and for, for logging in, folks, and, and being a part of this program. We really appreciate uh, everyone taking time out of their day to, to be a part of this for us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye.